In a world of 350 billion movie podcasts, two chumps have decided that now is the time for cult movies to engage in combat. Disagreements will be had, blood may be spilled, and voiceover artists most definitely will not be paid. This is Cult Film Face-Off. Hello and welcome to episode 37 of Cult Film Phase-Off. My name is Chuck Morris. With me as usual is Nick Leonard. Good day, sir. Uh, this episode is all about Toby Hooper, the director of one of the most iconic horror films of all time who sadly passed away uh, earlier this year. Uh, for better or for worse, and I have to say in terms of honouring the the, the, the man's memory is probably going to be for worse we're looking at the two films that he made with canon in the 1980s we're going to be looking at Life Force from 1985 and Invaders from Mars from 1986 uh, but we'll start off uh, of course with Life Force uh, following a close encounter aboard a spacecraft attached to Halley's Comet a trio of malevolent space vampires descends upon London to drain the life force from every human being on the planet Life Force from the director of Poltergeist and the writer of Alien comes a terrifying new film. I'm getting a very small radar cross section. 150 miles long. EGR's confirmed. Tell them we have an artificial object out here. In the tale of Haley's Comet, there's something wrong. Something ancient. Something evil. Jesus. Houston, we have a problem. Something's happening to me. Something hungry. That's brought to Earth. She's destroyed worlds. That girl was no girl. She was totally alien to this planet and our life form. And totally dangerous. Come. Be with me. Life Force. The terror has just begun. Okay, Life Force. I'd never seen this film. I was only sort of tangentially aware of it Would, uh, have you seen it before I have seen it before I own it when did you see I, it I own it um, I, I went through a stage of uh, in my teens when I first saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre of, of funny you know, we talked about in the last episode about you being a Sorry. bit of a George A. Romero completist yeah. and I did that on the Toby Hooper side Toby Hooper side of things so um, I've seen Life Force bought Life Force eaten alive Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 yeah so yeah I own Life Force so my my memory of Life Force was fucking hell what a mess <laughs> when did you last watch it then recently no I, 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 I bought it watched it once and it's sat on the shelf ever since mm. um, uh, did it hold up I mean is it better than you remember it funny yeah Better than I remember it. I mean, <laughs> what you remember from this film is, is, is a couple of things, and I know stuck in my head. There's things you don't forget. Um, this is like five different films smashed together, and I felt that this time watching it as well. Um, and Matil- uh, Matilda May's breasts. That's uh, what I was going to say. But you said two things stuck out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they get so much screen time and, and quite rightly so yeah right I mean, um, yeah, I mean, yeah I mean this this film is 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 is, is completely convoluted mm. um, but that's to not to say that it's not endearing at times there you know I'm a big sucker for a London location a London location which is being like overrun by like infected zombies mm. I wish it just had more self knowing in it I wish it was a bit more because it takes itself very seriously well I mean Toby Hooper said when he got given that budget he said I'm going to to make a Hammer horror film, and to be to be fair, I mean it has the air of one of those one of the lesser Hammer horror films. So I think that he achieved what he was trying to do. do you, I bet he didn't. I bet he didn't say that line to the investors of the film. I'm going to make. A I mean, film. I'm, yeah, I'm going to make a Hammer horror film in 1980 in 1985. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's got a 25 million pound budget. I think that he's the, got that was the biggest budget that Canon has ever. Unbelievable. Made. I mean, I mean, the three films that, that they had the biggest budget for was this Master of the Universe and Superman Four. Yeah. I mean, this has got to be top of that pole, right? I think so. Yeah, because I remember Superman Four had its budget cut like in the last yeah. minute. And it peanuts. I think this might be. I, I, I might might be wrong, but I think this was the biggest film they made. I think it doesn't. I mean, there is money on screen to a certain because it is ambitious. You know, it's an ambitious project, and that's what I kind of I, I do warn to it the fact that it's like they threw so much shit at the wall. Yeah. They wanted something to stick. I mean, they must have sat down and go right. We've got. We've got the writer from Alien, we've got the director of Poltergeist, and we've got a visual effects guy from Star Wars. Yeah. We're going to make something really big. Yeah. They didn't make something. No, they, <laughs> they made something incredibly confused. But it, there, is, I agree with you. There is something very endearing about it. First, first off, though, 
terrible title. Life Force is a fucking shit, mm. nondescript mm. title that I've heard through, and I'm just like, I'm not even going to pay... That's such a nondescript title, I'm not even going to pay attention to it. And the cover, the poster, yeah. is so lousy. It's have, you like, seen the, have you seen the Japanese poster? No, I bet it's great, though. It's on our Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I bet that's... You can see who runs that channel out of these two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so I mean, I'm, I'm happy that they had. Yeah, it's, a they, they got a great poster. Uh, Japanese poster is really good. Yeah, the, the UK and the US poster is dull. Uh, it doesn't say. I mean, yeah, it, it's fucking dull. I mean, the end of the world has come about by naked space vampires yeah. hitching a ride on the ass of Hades Comet. <laughs> yeah, right. Remember that's conveyed in the poster. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a picture of the globe with a spaceship at the top. I've seen that picture, that image. Hundreds of times throughout my childhood, you see it. I'm not going to rent that. Why on earth would I rent a film called Life Force with a yeah. fucking pic? Um, the reason that uh, they did it is because Golan and Globus of, of Canon, obviously, they wanted to differentiate this from this, the fucking cheap, shitty schlock they were making. And the book that it's based on is called The Vamp- It's called the Space Vampires. Why didn't you can film that? Well, I mean, I, and put the woman with the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> put the gorgeous woman on the front. I mean, they... Wanted, call it Space Vampires. They wanted to have it... They wanted like, to give it an air of class. Yeah, God, and yeah. this is the problem with the whole film, because I think Toby Hooper is seduced. So many film directors are seduced by the, the entire idea of theatrically trained British actors standing in a room and having a conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. even when it's irrelevant even when it's other stuff that's so fascinating he's meant to be going on elsewhere people just standing around and having conversations in rooms that is what this film's about that's one of the, the I can't quite believe uh, how much this film costs because there aren't that many complicated setups. there are a couple of big scenes in the London streets and stuff but by and large however I mean it went like four weeks behind schedule and it was massively bloated. I mean where did the money go it's people standing in rooms having conversations Patrick Stewart has got an absolutely outrageous rider right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I mean, I don't special effects. I mean, they, you know, you, uh, you've got to look at the. Uh, I mean, it obviously went into the special effects, right? I mean, part of that budget's gone into special effects. There isn't right? that. There's much... a lot of blue swirly lights going yeah, on, right, right. and you've got like quite a few models that are quite well done. I mean, I'll, I'll come on to those a bit later on in terms of where my lookalikes are because there's a couple of cracking oh, great. I didn't cadaver lookalikes okay. um, but there's quite a few animatronics people kind of you know, that costs money and there's quite a lot of different scenes with different animatronics and people kind of being infected lighting the, the, yeah, up and the, crumbling the, 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 the animatronics were really inconsistent the first few that you saw mm. they were the, the shots lingered on them and you were just like you should be cutting around it rather than just kind of putting this in, on screen and you got you, I think we've also got to kind of pay grace to the fact it's 1985 I agree but I think the, the later scene there's one scene where a woman's struggling and she's in a harness and I was like yeah, she's, lying, looks, she's lying on the table it's yeah, one of the best ones that looks amazing yeah. Yeah, 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 and the, yeah. the first the first lot that you see I was like they should be cutting they should be a bit more tactful editing because they're kind of just you're just looking at this animatronic thinking ah I, I, I did, I, did uh, I like the fact that uh, one of the early scenes uh, when they're, they're coming up to one of the one of the affected and you're like you know what state of the art you know obviously you'd think fuck hell you, you want to put loads of layers on make sure you're in a suit that does can't condone it he literally goes in in a suit and he's just got his face projected <laughs> <laughs> on his body like you're nothing on it yeah, right. he's just literally got the cheapest looking <laughs> protection suit yeah yeah, I mean it's mostly shot in the UK, yeah, right? Um, right yeah. And in and in and in studios, there's a, there's a, you know there's a lot of lot of, you know on location kind of uh, r- the rolling hills of, of the UK, and obviously in London. It's quite dark and moody at times. I mean, the, the actors are taking it very seriously. Well, I mean that's what they're paid for. That's that's why I think they. Ca- the, the, it seems like Toby Hooper's so seduced by those actors on screen. I think they're on screen way too much, and this is a mystery. They're trying to uncover a mystery, and the whole time I'm thinking, the mystery is happening elsewhere. This woman and these other um, aliens have come down. Where are they for the entirety of the film while you're having conversations about them? Any other? I kept thinking about Superman 2, when essentially three aliens come down, and it's, it's, a, it's a vaguely similar setup. Uh, and it, that film expertly cross-cuts between... Yeah. Between th- this is just you, you don't cross cut. I was like, where is it? The, 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 the aliens appear at the beginning and then they appear at the end. The whole time they're supposed to be causing carnage, they're barely in the film. It's not standing around and fucking having conversations in dark rooms. I mean, if you are going to basically have a plan of being a space vampire to come down to planet Earth and basically cause a mass outbreak of being space vampires and take over people's life forces, 
Would you have your three guys all land in the UK and stay in the, and stay in the UK? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that's not a great plan. No, I'm sure you'd go, let's ping off to three different continents <laughs> yeah, right. and start harvesting humans rather than, oh, let's all stay on this really small little island in Europe. To be perfectly honest, I thought the aliens can't have been that smart because, you know, the, the problem I had uh, is that in this film, they say a lot and then they don't show it. There's lots of conversations about this. There's one the other scene. Two, the other two don't get any screen time no, no, for no, obvious reasons. Obviously, yeah, yeah. But uh, there's literally a scene where Frank. Finley calls the main characters in the film and describes an action scene. This happened, then this happened. I was like, whoa, why are we seeing that? It's a com- it's a guy in a room on a phone. And then Frank Finley comes back at the end, towards the end. He's in the climax. And he it describes how they dis- how they kill these vampires for good. And then five seconds later, it's revealed that he's one of them. Yeah, that yeah. is not planning ahead, is it? But this is not the smartest species of alien in the world. It's, oh, yeah, this say he kill us. <laughs> I stick a stake in my heart. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose it's sticking to like the original, like, the vampire kind of folk to, of, you know, like... Dracula came over on a boat, didn't he? Yeah. In the original, yeah. in the original text, and then he had one human relationship, which is kind of the female has the one human relationship with that. He's a bad actor, that American dude. No, what's yeah. Steve Rouse? No, back? Come on. no, no. <laughs> come on. I don't think he. Uh, the problem is, I don't think he's a leading man. I, uh, he's like he reminded me of like Treat Williams or somebody. He does a lot with not very much. I thought I found him companion. He would he would make a great if he was a second fiddle. I think he would have had a better career. He's not leading he man too much stand, He had too much screen time. He did. He did. He's one of those people that would make a great sort of second tier, uh, a second tier villain more than anything else. I thought he's really good, but he's he's not a hero. He, he, you can't have any kind of sort of. Uh, you can't root for that guy at all. No, him. no. The the model for the alien ship looked like an art joke. <laughs> it did. It did. That's why the video box always annoys me. So I was like, "There's an Earth and there's an artichoke." I just, I, just, I don't understand. Like, what meeting you have where you go? We've got like blood sucking space vampires. Yeah. Well, obviously they're gonna have a badass ship. Yeah. An artichoke. <laughs> <I know>, an <laughs> artichoke. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, this is. A, I mean, I think the problem with this film is it, it has no rudder. It's a, There's no sense of urgency whatsoever. It is a mystery with these people trying to find out what's going on while. Essentially, action is happening elsewhere. When, it, when they turn up at the end and they've essentially carried out their evil plan for the most part, you know, why weren't we watching this unfold instead of watching people standing in rooms the whole time? Um, it should have been cross-cutting between plots and it doesn't. It stays with one thread and you just it should have been a bit more... It feels as if the whole film takes place over a matter of weeks. There's no, like, fuck, this is happening, we need to do something about there's, it. There's no real sense of uh, emergency or immediacy no, no, nothing. in, in, in no, no, what, no, what's happening. No. They're, they're kind of bumming around going, oh, ma- making these stark conclusions yeah. like, yeah. oh, well, they're going to basically, within two hours, they're going to have to have another life force. And also what they can do yeah. is they can jump into other humans as well, yeah. which is one of the best scenes, is when they go to the... the uh, when they go to the, the the asylum for the criminally insane, yeah. and there is a great moment when uh, Captain uh, Picard declares his love for t- Colonel Tom Carlson. It's <laughs> definitely one of the best scenes. Yeah. And the orderly, do you, did you recognise um, uh, the orderly, Lansom, from anywhere? Uh, vaguely, but well, I did, and I was doing my head, and I was like, where the fuck, who the, where the hell is he from? And he gets really malign, gets really treated like shit by everybody, right. and he kind of slopes off. And I was like. He's fucking Dirty Den cellmate in EastEnders. Oh, my God. Wow, I mean, that's a, that, is, that is a deep cut. <laughs> How many people know what we're talking about? That is a deep cut. <laughs> dirty Den cellmate from EastEnders. Has he done anything else more significant than that? Flash Gordon. Oh, right, OK. That's, that's yeah, he was one of uh, Brian Blitz's wingmen. <laughs> John Hallam. John Hallam, fair play. Yeah, and then he had to share a, he had to share a cell with Nick Cotton. <laughs> I was well into these days when I was about eleven. Oh, Nick Cotton, Dirty Den is Nick Cotton. They were both. They were, there was a. There was a. a, a st- I really apologise for, for for listeners who are not in the who are not based in the UK and, and don't have East Enders. Well, listen, East Enders. Hold fucking, on, mate, how, just quickly, Nick Cotton and Dirty Den shared a cellmate. No, no, yeah, basically. Yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> when when Dirty Den got incarcerated, he got befriended uh, by uh, uh, this guy called Barnsey. Right. Who is John Hallam, which is Lansom from Life Force, and uh, from, from what I, I remember is that he kind of took Dirty Den under his wing, so he didn't get attacked by the other prisoners. He left the prison, then Nick Cotton went into the same prison, and obviously they brought him back, and he ended up fucking beating up Nick Cotton and had to get moved to another cell. Okay, he was like a proper old man. How did you remember all that? He's then just my specialist subject. <laughs> he is eighty-eight to ninety. <laughs> Kill me. <laughs> 
<laughs> one thing I did think about the the opening is that there's there's a, there's one of the flattest jump scares I've ever seen in a oh, movie. Oh, it's terrible! Where it's terrible, but it's the jump is synonymous with a cut. So you're looking at something and then. And you're like, that, you can't do that. I mean, it's not even jumping out of the same frame. You can't just cut to something and go... It, 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 I was like, if this film's like this, I am going to absolutely hate it. To be fair, that is the only... That looks like something that was possibly done in post-production but, to try and well, get scare her out. I mean, it just befuddles me because Toby Hooper is responsible for one of the best kind of jump scares ever in cinema, in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, when Leatherface comes out from behind yeah. the, and, and then just cr- cracks him with the, with the, the hammer. That's what, that's what I mean... Uh, that's why I'm inclined to believe it was something that was hastily added. I mean, they. I mean, to, for them to just cut to it that absurdly, I thought that that was that must have been done in post production. Yeah. But um, I mean, the, the, when you're saying you didn't see where the money went in this, I mean, there's some quite, you know, some some, some sort of kind of special effects, some 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 animatronics, uh, uh, animatronics, some um, creature, some creatures that feature. I mean, there's a scene towards the end where literally she turns into that this kind of winged vampire, which right. literally only has about a couple of seconds of screen time. Yeah. But you know that took a fuck load of time to create. Apparently there are several cuts of this film in existence I don't know how many of them are commercially the available cut, yeah, which is 15 minutes longer than the theatrical cut I bet no cut of this film is short enough I think this is a very it's open long it was it long when long. I first watched it it was long when I watched it again and I watched this in kind of it, I think it is the perfect way to watch it I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning couldn't get back to sleep went downstairs and I watched Life Force that's the way to watch I mean I, I wish I watched this at 4 o'clock in the morning in a sort of haze well I watched it in a haze I was just like I know this is going to be fucking odd and off and completely and complete nonsense so it was the it was, it was the perfect way to watch it. So, uh, let's get down to brass tacks. Um, I've got some lookalikes. Um, no, I don't, unfortunately. They're in infected lookalikes. So, one of, one of the first um, guys that succumbs to, to becoming like an infected basic zombie um, would be handy if, if, uh, if play was called off in Wimbledon and it started raining. Dave Richard? Oh, wait a minute. Okay, I, th- I, I think that's... Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, that sounds all right. Second... I mean, I'm right. No, I mean, he's completely on the money. He's Cliff Richard. Cliff Richard. The second one is a, it's a female uh, infected on the streets of London in the last 20 minutes of the film wearing a maroon Adidas tracksuit and uh, Darlene Connor from Roseanne. Well, wow, okay. <laughs> okay, I can't wait to find that. So, um, uh, um, thanks for the description. I'm going to have to dig her out from. Is it, is it last, three, last three minutes of the film? Okay, and uh, there's speaking? a sequence where um, the other main character, the English actor, who looks a lot like a guy who played Doctor Who in the I 80s. Thought, well, I thought it was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Doctor Who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 no, it wasn't got him. No. Uh, when he's like, it's literally he's getting, he's on his mission to get towards the church. I remember, I remember the bit, yeah. So she's yeah, it cuts around. away when he's in the car and she's like, <gasps> yeah, Darlene Connor. Okay. Rosa. Cool. You got any? Oh, no, no, I didn't, I didn't see any, unfortunately. No, no. Um, it is, it, it's certainly a watchable film if you're in a very undemanding mood, but it is too damn long winded and there's not enough action in it. I mean, there's legend has it that Canon films, they pick scripts to produce effectively at random. I don't know how true that is, but there's a lot of stuff about that in that documentary, you know, Electric. It's a great Google. documentary. Very enjoyable. So, I mean, I, this feels like three scripts were picked and they were kind of. Well, this feels together. like five films smashed together. I mean, it is. I mean, it is literally they've just got bits of films and put them all together. As it goes on, it gets madder and madder. And there's suddenly the mention of the insane asylum, like you said, um, and then Steve rails back and suddenly read people's minds and you're like where the fuck is it this room's just there's a child killer and they're, they're yeah. mentally saying like, what's going on it, it's fucking madder than a bag of snakes it's, it's, which is what makes it endearing it is endearing um, oh, and you have got some really good British character actors in there you've got um, Sir Perry Heseltine I mean, I'm, I mean I've got a lot of enjoyment um, Sir Perry Heseltine he, he's basically like an eccentric English actor I'm, I'm recognising him immediately because he played Deltoid in uh, Clockwork Orange yes Alex yes Alex <laughs> Um, and he just kind of has this weird every reaction shot when he looks at people being turning infected and everything he's just got this like Popeye <laughs> it seems like he's got one fake eye or something but he, I got a lot of enjoyment out of just watching him until he, he, he kind of he got he knocked off yeah. he's a great screen presence he's very funny so he has like one eye closed and he's no oh, he just, he just uh, he's just got this he's just oh, every, he's just OTTing every reaction shot and it's brilliant did you have a single favourite scene? mine's more of a moment than a scene um, did I prefer, oh I, it's difficult because I mean 
there was a scene that I completely had forgotten. It's not my favourite scene. I think everything in the mental asylum is good. I like the, the, the mental asylum as, 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 a, as a part of the film. The mental asylum, I think, works really well. Patrick Stewart precursoring him being a Magneto in later life, being in a wheelchair. And uh, him uh, being Professor X. Professor Ma- X. Magneto, sir. Please don't tar and feather me, fans <laughs> of that universe. Yeah, I, I th- a, f- a scene that I found really funny is um, it is basically like this woman seducing like this farmer and the drive that they have and her trying to be... Oh, that's <laughs> right. Lifting her skirt on. It's stuff. terrible. Yeah. It is it, it's like proper confessions of a... Farmer. Farmer. <laughs> <laughs> um, my favourite... It's not a scene, it's a moment, but when the uh, the naked woman, the alien, is, is escaping the facility... Oh, the guards chat to each other. No, no, no. It's the guards trying to sort of lure her so they can capture her. And the lead uh, security guard is trying to entice her with what looks like a bit of bread... Or a lot of oh, a, a cracker. Does, does, he does, said, yeah. I was like, imagine if that were yeah. just all, <laughs> a bit of cracker. <laughs> It's not a parrot. <laughs> no, I know, but they're, they're not, it looks like a hunk of bread. No, I, 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 it rings a bell, but he has something innocuous in his hand. You're like, and that's you're... not, not fucking, that wouldn't work on anything, any species, unless it was a parrot. So, life falls to me. Um, it's, it's ambitious. It's so ambitious. But it, it's a complete mess. But it's not without merit. I mean, if it was just a, if it was 90 minutes, it would be a lot more palatable. Yeah, it's, hard it's, to, it's, hard, it's hard to recommend mm. at such length. But it's not without it's not without it being enjoyable. I you know? can understand. I, did, I, 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 I mean, I will say this: I enjoyed this way more than the next film we're about to talk about. Oh, spoiler alert! Can we not do that? Well, we can do, but I suppose that, I mean anybody who'd want. To, if there are any people listening to see who wins, they're just like, all right, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> uh, I won't reveal which film I thought was better. But yeah, I did. I did understand. But we're going to talk about two films, aren't we? Oh, maybe that's two. Okay, that's ten. Take that out. It's fine. It's fine. I did. I did find it endearing. Uh, it's you know you don't see films like that every day. I mean you don't. You really films don't. Like this don't. I mean it's, it inhabits. I think its own kind of space to a certain degree. Yeah, it's it's a twenty five million pound film which kind of looks like five films mashed together, yeah. which has a chick walking around for most of it naked. It, is, yeah. I mean, it does stick in your mind, this film. Yeah, and it does look nice. Alan Hume is a cinematographer. He you know, he worked on the Bond films. He did yeah. Return of the Jedi. Yeah. And he, he does look like a classy production, even when it's set. It's, it's just a mess. Best, I mean, there, there's tal- there is talented people working on this, and you can see that. It's just like fucking... I just, I just wish it was a little bit more self-knowing and a, a, a little bit shorter, obviously. Yeah, it, it's 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 all over the place. It's not. I just wish there was a bit more drama. There's no, there's a lack of drama. But yeah, I mean, an interesting folly for sure. Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah. I would not disagree with that. Okay. Well, right, well, let's move on to our second film, which is Invaders from Mars from 1986. After witnessing what appears to be a flying saucer landing in his back garden one night, young David Gardner suspects that his parents have been assimilated by alien life forms and enlists the help of his school's nurse to help uncover the truth. Invaders from Mars. David Gardner just woke up to a nightmare in his own backyard. But no one will listen. No one will believe. I told you, he needs psychiatric help. And soon, no one will be left. Dad? Are you okay, Dad? (laughs) Fine. Because something strange is happening to the people of Willow Creek. Everything's fine now. And David Gardner is about to find out why. David! I'm gonna find my mom and dad! Canon Films presents Toby Hooper's Invaders from Mars. There's no place on Earth to hide. Okay, so Invaders of Mars, uh, I had not... I'm sure I'd heard of it, but uh, yeah, I'd never seen it. What about you? I'd never seen it. I'm vague. I mean, it's, it's a remake, so yeah, yeah. I don't know whether I'd heard of the 1953 film or this. Yeah. Um, so how, how did it go down? Uh, <laughs> I mean, like a heavy sack of shit. Yeah. Um, the opening sequence is a small child uh, looking out of his bedroom window um, at a flying piece of faecal matter. I um, mean, he, he's the, the reaction shot of the boy is actually one of the best things in this film. Oh. It really, genuinely is. And the fact that the, the kid looks like a young Eric Bristow. <laughs> um, he is a terrible. 
terrible. I can't. I can't. I can't overstate this enough. Kid. The kid is a terrible actor. You reckon? He's all. He can't even run convincingly. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I thought everything about this film was overwhelmingly poor. So I, I guess he didn't stand out as. He is ter- a. Te- oh, he, I mean, he was terrible. He's the worst thing about it. <laughs> well, with a better, you know, kid, more endearing kid, it could have been slightly better than it was. Oh, yeah. <sighs> You've got some very talented people working on this film, mm-hmm. right? You've got Stan Winston. Yeah. You've got Dan O'Bannon, and you've got. Toby Hooper I mean all having the biggest off days of their careers and then as far some, as I'm concerned yeah and then some um, it, this is a terrible I mean this is a really bad film I was so bored by it yeah but it, it feels like the people making it were bored it, I, I was really confused as to what inspired anybody involved to, to, to make it or to continue making it it's such a woozy it, it, it is a shit film. I mean, the mo- one of the most interesting things about it is that when it starts, I was like, what the fuck is up with those titles? They have those whooshy titles that are... I, bet I think it's trying to be evocative of, like, you know, of the original. What I think happened is that by that point, they'd already decided they were going to make Superman 4. So someone said to the guy in the titles, brush up on your whooshy titles. <laughs> We've got a really big whooshy title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is exactly those Superman titles. <laughs> I was like, that doesn't seem massively appropriate. Right. And it opens... Before the scene you mentioned, with a sort of unbelievably sugary and unbelievably phony and unbelievably awkward scene of his oh family interacting, dude, it was so saccharine. I was like, <laughs> yeah, and it, and, and it's badly done and it, it's phony. And I, if I was a prosecution, if I was a prosecutor in a, a court case to finally determine who directed Poltergeist. That would be Exhibit A, because yeah. there's nothing that, that anywhere near that bad. That, that, I was watching it's like Spielberg directed Poltergeist. Yeah. There's no way yeah. that two the same person directed the scenes in that and the scene. It's a complete, it's a complete polar opposite. Yeah. Um, Spielberg actually looms quite large over this film because all of his tropes are here. I mean, even the one sort of the primary scene in the school, they're dissecting frogs exactly yeah. as they do in each. I mean, the, the number of things where you just think. They must have really, really fucking tried. I bet they tried to get Spielberg somehow on board to direct this fucking absolute dreck. I mean, this film's so bad, I do wonder how good the original was. How good can it have been? This, this the fucking story's whack. This film lacks any suspense or tension. There's none at all. You never feel that the kid's in danger. You never feel that the aliens as well. I mean, these aliens look like... Um, what's the name of the female plant in Little Shop of Horrors? Oh, well, I mean, yeah. yeah I know it looks like it's got a big mouth. Yeah. They've got, like, little mongoose legs that don't go very fast. I mean, they you know... And then you've got the precursor to... Um, the baddie in uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, Kerrang, yeah. Yeah, Kerrang. Yeah. I mean, it's all just completely lacklustre crap. I thought they looked like critters, kind of like blown up critters. I mean, those 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 uh, sort of aliens would look a lot better if they weren't moving so much. Like, they needed to be a bit more... Again, yeah, there's a lack of... Kind of... <laughs> yeah, th- that's what I mean. When they're bobbing along, you just think that's just a guy in a fucking shit yeah, outfit. Yeah. I mean, if, again, again it, it's similarly to some moments in Life Wars. If they were a bit more tactful about how it was edited and shot, I think it might have been a bit better. But I thought it was quite interesting that, in a way, these are both kind of inspired by Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh, actually, there's one thing that I do think was funny. Toby <laughs> Toby Hooper can't direct actors who are being shaken by the environment. There's a scene in Life Force on, an, on a chopper where oh, he says, oh, no, no, shake. No, no, no. And there's a bit where the two guys go down and they, they, yeah, start, yeah, they start... And they're both shaking out of scene. And, and, the, and the, the earth moves, it comes through the, the so, floor. Yeah, in, in, yeah. But the guy's going... Yeah, yeah, it looks really bad. <laughs> yeah, that, that, would be, that would be a decent gif. But yeah, this turns into a chase film for a bit and then it's a really, really unbelievably shaky action film towards the end, but... It, everything's like it's, everything is routine. Yeah. I watched it just thinking, who, who who's this is nobody's passion. Yeah, I mean, I, I just thought it, it, was, it was incredibly mundane. It's really, um, I mean, really. Just like did you learn? Did you learn anything from this film? No. Like, I, I learned that NASA leases its launch facilities from the U.S. Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's a good. That's a good. That's, that's certainly a lesson to be learned. Um, I, no, I didn't learn anything. And I, I felt like it was an, out, an outbreak of Scientology in the beginning. I mean, how how is how is how his parents are uh, like Scientology. conversating? Yeah, right. Scientology, or, or they've been prescribed mass doses of Ritalin. Yeah, right. Um, and also, I mean, uh, what's meant to make you feel kind of like squirmy and that they've gone really weird is that the, the mother eats raw beef patty. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's just rubbish. Rubbish. Yeah, and I've... then actually, in the ending as well. I mean, the, you know, this film is marketed to be for, for young children, right? Um, I mean. It's quite a nasty ending. <laughs> yeah. Whose idea was that, and why? 
It doesn't really. It doesn't, the tone is quite inconsistent from being very schmaltzy and kind of, and then to having an extremely. You know, it was all a dream, but oh no, it wasn't. And you, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, would I, I was watching it thinking, would I have enjoyed this as a child? Oh, fucking would not have enjoyed this as a I child. Don't think no I would way. Have it was. I was fucking boring. I'd have been yeah. bored as a kid. I mean, it's, you know, we've I'd, I'd have remembered. I'd have, I'd have gone. Ugh. Well, not as a kid. I would have said Nurse Fletcher eating a frog. Yeah. Uh, but I would have said the frog eating scene would have probably stuck in my mind as a ten year old. Yeah, right. The rest of it, I'd have been gone. This is guff. It's yet another film that we've covered where I'm convinced if nostalgia did not exist, there would be no way to Th- see there this is, film. There is a lot of love for this film. You're joking. You look at uh, people's reviews on the IMDb, and it is pages and pages of people pouring praise on this film. I, I'm so, that's I mean, I honestly believe that that's it's nostalgia. It has to be. I I don't know where, 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 there's no other explanation for it. It's a badly made film. It's a badly conceived idea. The script's bad. The acting is mostly pretty fucking poor. And I just watched it just thinking, who is it? It's like nobody cares. I, I, I don't know who cares about what's going on. The only thing that I liked about it is the, the way they kind of vaguely spookily keep... They never refer to the crash site. They keep saying, over the hill. Oh, come yeah, with us over the hill. Yeah. Which is like, you know... It's like, ambiguity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, in a nightmare, the most mundane thing, yeah. repeat, you know, over the hill. So yeah. Let's go over the hill. There's, there's something about that, that I thought was reminiscent of like a ghost story or something like that. that I thought, that, I mean, that's about... As far as pluses go, that's about it. Because um, that's Karen Black and the boy. That's... They are mother and son. Are they? Yeah. What? Yeah. That's Karen Black's kid. Mm. I had no idea. Mm. How strange. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Toby Hooper, I'm just, it's, it's so confusing. I, he does a dolly zoom once in a scene in the school. It seems like he did it just to try and make it, because you know, everything is shot reverse shot. It's shot in the blandest way possible. It seemed like he thought, I better do something that makes it stand out. Compared to the episode, you know, our last episode when we talked about George Romero, he just had this impassioned desire. He could feel it to tell his story. And I don't know, nobody has any of that kind of passion. And you just think, we're watching... What even are we watching? What the yeah, fuck is I mean, the point yeah, of this? Is, what, you know, looking at the, the previous episode with Giorgio Romero, I mean, he, is a, he, has, he has a very firm stamp on style in terms of context. Yeah, with, I, I mean, I couldn't, you couldn't say to me, Life Force and Invaders from Mars and go, can you say any similarities? In the, can we do completely different directors? I didn't see any similarity between those two films. Well, how they were directed. I mean, the thing is that the, uh, the, they were directed by Canon Pictures. Golan and Globus were deal makers more, more, and this is the, the, these are two films that were part of larger deals. I'm sure they don't feel like anybody wanted to make them at any point. I, I reckon the writers. I mean, it's, it's the same writers again. It's Dan O'Bannon and his writing partner yeah. um, Don yeah. Don Jacoby. Yeah, uh, the, I would not be surprised to find out that they wrote this in a fucking day or or, 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 or two days. I mean, it's such a shoddy. Uninteresting, and it just seems like everybody's so uninterested in this script. I mean, this is a this is an unspeakably lousy film. Um, yeah, I truly believe without nostalgia, there'd be no way you'd be able to find this. It would have been buried. Right. Well, um, I mean, we got. I think it's pretty clean cut. Well, I mean, I feel bad because Toby Hooper. We haven't done him the greatest. Well, we haven't done him the greatest. I mean, I, have, I, have, I still have never seen uh, the Eaten Fun Alive. House. I've never seen Eaten Alive or for the Fun House. Fun House oh, I haven't seen the Mangler. I haven't seen. Fun, the... Well, I haven't seen the Mangler. Um, but uh, I mean, the thing is, I mean, I, I would love to hear from Toby Hooper fans. I'd love to, you know, we 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 purposely chosen two films that are fringe and two films that are linked with each other because they're sci-fi films by the canon. By the canon, yeah. Um, I've seen Fun House. I wasn't. I wasn't that taken with fun to be honest. I, yeah, I've um, seen bits of those movies and I'm just... Toby Hooper is the most confounding of all those masters of horror mm. because he... I always... I, even before I saw these two films, I always felt like Toby Hooper seemed like the kind of guy who'd sold his soul to make possibly the greatest horror film ever made. The thing about Texas Chainsaw Massacre is it is wall-to-wall directorial choices and flourishes that just fucking floor you. You're just like, uh, this is the directorial debut for the ages. That is in the top three best directorial debuts, bar none. Possibly, I mean... If we were to pull all of those masters of horror, Wes Craven, yeah. uh, put Can't all of their films yeah. together, I, I think the best film that any of them ever made was Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is my favourite horror film of all time. Yeah, I don't, think it's even, <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily that close either. It is an unbelievable masterpiece, and it's all Toby Hooper. It is the, the fl- just the decisions that he makes and the flourishes. And to see these two films, and you're just like, 
I had the same guy do. It, it's, yeah. it's so weird. It's so weird. You just, it's like, but but then again, I am inclined to be the Toby Hooper feels or, or felt the way that we did because his next film after making these two films was t- uh, Texas Strange Massacre 2, yeah. which is like him torching <laughs> everything he's ever done in the most glorious fashion. Yeah. So in a way, it was kind of worth it. But um, he, he was, he, he, yeah, he's a strange figure. I need to go and watch the rest of his films. I think maybe we'll do another. Maybe we'll do another two Romero films. Yeah. And another I two. Want, I think what would be really good is, is to hear from people and what, what, what that, yeah. you would like us to cover from these two. You know, and we have done fringe. You know, we have done. We've purposely gone. We found two things that were very, very close linked, and we yeah. either. I, well, I didn't realise you'd seen yeah. Life Force, but I thought yeah. we hadn't seen them. So, I thought they would be a good pairing. But um, yeah. the, the, uh, in terms of picking which ones, which I think we've made it blatantly obvious, but. Uh, even if I wasn't as unimpressed with uh, Invaders from Mars as I am, you can't tell the story of canon without life force. It's an integral part of that story. Um, and this uh, uh, um, Invaders from Mars is not even a worthwhile footnote. And I think even that documentary about canon, I think they, they ignored it. No, they ignored it because it's irrelevant. There's no, there's no footage of Invaders from Mars. No, it's, because why would you? It's an irrelevant film in their uh, in their history. I, it, it is. It deserves to be completely forgotten. It's nothing. It's yeah, so I mean, I mean, in terms of which one's better, it's Life Force by a million miles. But yeah, yeah, it, it's one of the clearest kind of. It's a, it's a chasm um, in terms of all, uh, all the films we've been, we've been doing since doing this podcast. The, I mean, this is there. There is just, there is starchings. There's open and shut cases, but like, yeah, there's. I mean, I mean, I mean I, it's from Mars is a horrifically weak offering. It's a standard issue kids movie made by people who don't have any interest in anything. Yeah, I just found, what I found so confounding about it is that there's so many talented people working on it. I, I don't know. I mean, it's a mystery. I just, it needs to go away. I, no, nobody needs to, yeah. nobody needs to see that movie. Life Force, if you're patient and you're sort of uh, fond of very, very eccentric blockbusters, I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, that's as eccentric as they fucking get. Yeah. Um, so yeah the winner is uh, uh, Life Force by Mark that's it um, but absolutely yeah, thank you very much for listening uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks but yeah uh, check out all of our social media uh, things for updates and whatnot. Uh, you, all of our uh, episodes are cut to footage on YouTube and uh, yeah we'll be back in a couple of weeks but uh, thanks for listening see you later ciao bless hack it Film Face Off. Whoa, did someone get the license number of that movie? This is the wildest thing I've seen in ages. It's called Life Force, and it's so bizarre, I don't know how to explain it. It starts as an outer space movie, then becomes a vampire movie, and then turns into an end of the world movie. I think I know the word to describe this film. Berserk! See? He too needs feeding. Don't try to understand all this from a few film clips. It's tough enough when you've seen the whole picture. Steve Railsback plays an astronaut who becomes explorer, carrier, and victim all at once after a terrible discovery in space. I couldn't expose the world to what we'd brought back with us. This movie reminded me of all the crummy science fiction and horror films I used to see at Saturday matinees when I was growing up. I'll bet guys like Toby Hooper, who directed this film, and the fellows who wrote it saw the same movies. They even put in some of the same stupid dialogue, only this one is sexier and crazier and full of incredible special effects. Now, am I saying this is a good movie? <laughs> no way. But if you go with a bunch of friends, buy a lot of popcorn, and treat the whole thing as a goof, you might have fun with it. You've got to meet it halfway, the way I will by giving it a five. But remember, this picture is insane. I'm Leonard Malton, Entertainment Tonight.